Hey, Tommy, dare I say it, but uh, there are some new cars out that we're looking forward to driving, and we've driven some really cool cars uh, on this episode of our podcast slash video, TFL Talk. We're going to discuss it. All of that. What are we talking about? Yeah, very cool stuff today. So we were in California driving a whole slew of brand new electric cars over the last week, which we're going to discuss in this podcast. Plus, we're going to also talk about the cars to look forward to in 2022. So these are future models that we are really excited to drive, and you should be as well. Yeah, so I was in California driving actually three cars, believe it or not. Uh, I was there in L.A., and you were in San Diego. We were really close to each other, and I was driving the new Mercedes SL. Uh, I was driving the new AMG EQS and the new Porsche GTS. Uh, and what were you driving? I was driving the Hyundai Ioniq 5, which is a game changer of an electric car. And lots and lots and lots of fun stuff to talk about in today's podcast. Once again, if you're listening on Spotify or on Apple Podcasts, thank you so much. If you're watching on YouTube a couple days later, check out the podcast platforms if you want early access to this podcast. And yeah, what they can see is that you are no longer wearing glasses. What happened, dude? That's right. I got eye surgery, so I have. I've, I'm no longer wearing glasses. It's been the first time since I think like third grade, which is a very weird feeling. But uh, very excited to be glasses free. Not that any of that matters on an audio podcast, but uh, it matters a lot to you. Well, it does to me. But if you're if you're listening, like yeah. It doesn't change anything. So, so are you going to put on like some cool sunglasses now, the non-prescription kind, you know, where you can just like, you know, not have to deal with all that, all that drama with getting the prescription and making sure that it fits right, just going to the store and, you know, popping on some cool shades? I'm not sure I am cool enough for that quite <laughs> yet. So that'll take some trendy music to kind of build up that coolness factor to wear cool sunglasses. But yes, very excited to be glasses free for the first time in a long time. All right, well, let's get to the exciting stuff. The people are here to talk about cars. So let's talk about cars, Tommy. And if you're listening to this uh, right away, which is Monday, then you know that the new Civic Type R just dropped. It was unveiled like the last one on Suzuka Raceway in uh, Japan. So it's over your shoulder there. Um, what do you think of it? I think it looks very, very cool. So we still don't really have the full design because they wrapped it in this crazy like Christmas gift wrapping to hide the fine lines. But it looks to be a big improvement over the last generation, which was a little bit too crazy with the scoops and the flares and the wings. The new one looks to be a little bit more toned down, but still very track focused. Yeah, I don't think uh, I'm going to I'm going to. Uh, let the cat out of the bag, I guess. Uh, Paul, who used to be the Stig on Top Gear USA, recently took the new SI around our track, and he was not all that pleased, I have to say. But the SI, keep in mind, is not the crazy hard-going one. That's just kind of the street performance monster. It's not supposed to be the track focus model. That's where this comes in the Type R with the big sticky tires and the 300 horsepower 2 liter turbo. And we don't know the full specs on the brand new 11th generation Type R, but if it's anything like the older one, it should be very, very, very fun. Yeah, we haven't published Paul's video yet, but you know, a lot of people, a lot of buzz out there online and a lot of people are afraid that they're going to do with the Type R what they did with the SI, uh, which is, you know, actually um, give it less horsepower, which is, you know, something that most manufacturers very rarely do. Uh, in an, especially in a performance-oriented car. Yeah, but it's not like it's a thousand horsepower less. It's just a slight drop over the previous generation. Yeah, but it signals other intentions. Mm, I don't know, Dad. I think that the 11th gen is a much uh, welcome improvement over the 10th gen. It's got this really cool interior that I just experienced with this huge I lo I love, vent. I love the interior. I love the honeycomb uh, uh, air vents. I, I think the interior is the best part of the car, but uh, I think especially with ESI, they did take it down a notch in terms of its kind of on-road versus track ability. And let's face it, the SI was always kind of like the, you know, the weekend track vehicle. I mean, it only comes in a stick shift, which should say to a lot of people that this is a serious sports car. Excuse me, when is the last time you went to the track? For well, fun. I'm just saying, but that... Exactly. That, it doesn't matter, Dad. It, I mean, slightly less track focus. What does that mean? The new SI is just as fun as the old one. It still has a fantastic six-speed. Um, maybe it's not quite as nimble around the track, but the SI has not been the the go-to um, cup car, right? That's always been like a Miata or or maybe like a Shelby GT350. The SI has been, let's get to school a little bit quicker, look a little bit cooler. Look, hey, as long as they get rid of those Recaros so that I can actually fit in the Type R, I'll be happy because uh, my big bone butt uh, will not fit in the current Type R uh, with those sports seats. Uh, so uh, I'm looking forward to actually, you know, having a vehicle that hopefully suits big guys like me. Um, I think sometimes the Japanese who are, let's face it, in general, very uh, 
Uh, well, they're shorter than Americans, right? And they're probably thinner than Americans. So when you get a tall, not thin American uh, in a car, uh, it feels like the car was definitely not designed for me. And I love that car. And it, it's just, it's like the Miata, same thing. You know, I just don't fit. And it's, it's, it's very frustrating. And look, I'm not whining about, but well, maybe I am whining, but I shouldn't be. I mean, you know, being tall and big is, in, in most part, it's a good thing, except for on a plane, of course. But yeah, just design cars for us big guys. Well. What? I mean, it, it could be like a motivation. For me to lose weight. Is exactly that what, is that right. what you're saying? You, you put the dots is, is that together. What the I didn't are, say it. Is that what the Japanese are doing? They're like, those, that Roman, he could certainly lose a few pounds, so we'll, we'll make the seat so tight that he can't breathe. Well, let's be honest, though. The, the SI, the Type R, these are not vehicles for a more advanced age demographic, oh, right? Oh, no, no. Yeah, I'm going after my weight, but you're going after my age as well. <laughs> Ouch! This Ouch! A, what do I do? What do I? Do? Those eyes are too sharp now. This is What's the going vehicle. On? This is the vehicle for lean, mean youths <laughs> who are well in their prime and can appreciate the bolstering on the aggressive seats. I think I need to turn up my ear ear aid just so I can hear that exhaust noise. Is that what they, you're saying? That's exactly uh -huh. what I'm saying. Yes, uh -huh. they don't. They don't have a Bluetooth straight to the hearing aid functionality. <laughs> uh, What's Bluetooth? Well, you can Bluetooth the exhaust right to the hearing aid. Bluetooth. I don't have a Bluetooth, Tommy. Yeah, I know. Exactly right. Wouldn't that be cool, though? Imagine, like, a new Corvette. This would be great for Corvette buyers. What? Right? You could have, like, a Bluetooth functionality with your new advanced <laughs> hearing aid hearing. that'll pump in the exhaust directly into your ears. I think that's a good idea. Or electric cars. <laughs> How come no one has thought of that, as, like, to, to fake the exhaust note directly into a hearing aid? Uh, because uh, it's uncool and makes you feel <laughs> uncool. I mean, it wouldn't work with like a youthful car like a Golf GTI, <laughs> oh, right? Oh, oh. But like a 911 Turbo? Have you ever seen a young guy in a 911 Turbo? No way. Unless Porsche they're, should uh, invest in unless this. Unless they're a YouTuber, probably not. Porsche should invest in this. Same thing with Corvettes. You know, every C7, C8 Corvette maybe. All right, Porsche. The there, there you go. Forget about the watches. Forget about the cool pens. Go for a hearing aid. <laughs> yeah, I think that's because the old hearing aids used to be. I know a lot about hearing Porsche aids. Porsche design hearing aids. Yeah. My, my grandpa just got hearing aids. Yeah. Um, I know a lot about them, and some of the new ones are very advanced and have a lot of cool technologies. So a little Porsche design on the hearing aid. Yeah. Why not? And then and um, then you could like have don't, that. Don't make it like note. skin color. Make it like really loud. Like you can really see what you're wearing in your ear. Sure. Like like you know red. Yeah, you white, can have and blue. a mamba green hearing aid. I think that's a good idea. Someone's gonna take me up on what, that. What does Porsche call that green color in there? It's it's like a snake. Is that a snake? Isn't it mamba green? Is it mamba? I thought it was like after a frog. That I don't think it's frog really green. I don't yellow. think it's Kermit green. No. It wasn't Kermit. No, it was like, anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, let's keep going, Tommy. What other cars are we looking forward to driving? There's a whole bunch. Obviously, the uh, Corvette uh, Z06 is coming. Yep. So as much as I just made fun of the Corvette, I am stoked <laughs> about the new Z06, which is a naturally aspirated mid-engine Corvette with an RPM red line of over 8,000, like 8,500, an absolute screamer. So the latest news is, of course, that they've stopped building Corvettes because of the tornadoes. Uh, so, um, yeah, that's no good. You know, uh, here's the thing. Every time I see these high-powered sports cars that everybody gets excited about, I think of, like, the Tesla Model S Plaid. I was just watching uh, one, one, of, uh, one of the guys that's been doing this a long time, Carlos, right? He just moved to Car and Driver, uh, moved to Michigan, and he just did his review uh, of uh, the Tesla Model S Plaid. Uh, and one of the things that he was comparing it to was a Bugatti Chiron. Uh, and that in, in most ways, it's actually quicker uh, than like the most expensive hypercar ever built. So how is a Corvette going to compete with a Plaid in terms of just sheer uh, performance numbers? Because there are the Elon Musketeers and then there are the real car enthusiasts who care more about zero to 60 times. Oh, did you hear that burn? That was a good burn. I'm so, I get so tired of this. Like, oh, well, it's slower than the Tesla Model S Plaid. Yes, we get it. The Tesla Model S Plaid is faster than your 1978 Porsche 911. Like, whoa. Whoa, no, it's faster than your 2022 Porsche 911 GT3. How, how quick do you need to go from zero to 60? You do that three times and then you're bored of it. Look, when you're in eighth grade, right the the bragging rights go to the quickest car it's it, it's that's just human nature so yeah you're right it, it's hard to sell um like like you know the aesthetics of driving a, a well-sorted machine versus like you know the 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 the, the puke inducing zero to 62 second time that a tesla model s plaid will do Yes, but the Tesla Model S Plaid, then, let's be honest. The Model S is going on nine years old now. It's been facelifted, but not enough. The steering wheel is like a cafeteria tray for some reason. It's a random square. Look, I'm not a fan of the it's, yoke. 
Yeah. I'm not a fan of the design. You're right. It's old. But what I will tell you is when a Tesla Model S Plaid lines up, especially here at a mile above sea level, against the new Z06, it's going to cream it at Bandemir, which is our drag strip. And and the guy, you know, it, it, you know what it is. It's the guy in the Tesla Model S Plaid will look it over at the Corvette and he'll be like, ha, 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 hold my beer, and he'll be gone. And, and it won't be just by a little bit. I mean, you know, that's a nine-second car, and I don't think a Z06 is going to be anywhere near nine seconds, but especially if, here at If Alpha I'm Team. buying a sports car, yeah. I mean, I care a little bit about 060, but I care more about the drama and the sound and the design and the beauty. Yeah, of you're, the you're selling the, the driving aesthetics versus... Yes, and then, and, and but then yes. But that's very European. In America, we are all about No, I disagree. I disagree. Some guy that looks like he just pulled out of an Apple store pulls up <laughs> well, next to well, a Bandemir. It's fun for... For like the first time here, and you're like yes nice ray-bans but after that you're like Ugh. here's the problem you want to go you you know you want to go do a lap uh around any racetrack no i don't care about right, but, saying, but i saying, care you, about the sound you, and the you drama want, you want to go do a lap at laguna seca it's going to cost you probably thousands if not tens of thousands right there's just you just can't show up and say hey here's 45 bucks let me run what i brung Whereas you can do that uh, at any local drag strip, and that's why drag racing has always been kind of the people sport versus, you know, track racing has always been the gentleman's sport. In other words, guys with money. Uh, and America has always been more about like the everyman versus the, you know, the rich man. Even though I think I feel like that is changing recently with what's going on in this country. But nevertheless, um, it's going to be a, a tough sell. Uh, and I wonder, you know, can. Um, traditional internal engine, internal combustion engine cars compete with a new crop of electric cars. First of all, I think there are very few people cross shopping a beautiful two-seater mid-engine car with a four-door sedan. I just I don't see that happening. Mm. If you want a Corvette, you're not <laughs> you're not all of a sudden gonna be like, well, the Tesla's quicker. Let me just go buy the Tesla. Tesla's also ridiculously expensive, well One, over hundred thousand dollars. Yep. Um, and then the last thing I'll say on the we subject... Don't know, well, we don't know the pricing on the Z06, but we do know that even though Corvettes are affordable, every dealer in this country is charging 50 k over sticker, it seems like. The one thing I will say, last thing about the drag racing, is I, I had the opportunity to take our Model Y performers to the drag strip for yep. a video, and then I stayed late just to like have fun with yes, it. Yes, I remember you did, yeah. And there is absolutely no fun after like the fourth time doing it. Yeah, it's the same. It's there's no the same. skill, there's no drama, it's all-wheel drive, it just goes. And like, yes, you just beat the... It's a computer. The Mustang GT next to you but like the fun thing about drag racing is you know you got to get the launch right you got to get the 60 foot right and the, the traction and the slip and then you go and you mess with the carbs or you you change the boost on the turbo and there's just none of that with the tesla i agree i agree it's it's like a computer and it's almost identical type it's every time unless there's more wind blowing or something right and where's the fun in that you know if you want to do that just go buy forza and save yourself a hundred and $69,000 or whatever it is. All right, let's talk about some other vehicles we're looking forward to driving. Of course, there is uh, a new Bronco coming, um, and that's going to be exciting if Ford can ever catch up on demand. Uh, so it's the new, there's two new Broncos. There's the Everglade, which is a Bronco with a winch and a spoiler. No, a winch and a snorkel, sorry. Uh, and then, of course, there's the new Raptor uh, Bronco coming. So those will be fun. Uh, to me, you know, we've got that Sasquatch parked in front of this camera right here. I'm not sure you need to go much bigger than that. I think that's kind of the perfect sweet spot. But then again, you know, once again, bigger, more powerful, better in a lot of ways in America. But did you see that Everglades? That thing is really cool. I you mean, like the, the, rap the Raptor's cool because it's wide-bodied and, you know, it's a... But the, the Everglades looks like a, an Overland Adventure vehicle, and that is the one that I think is really, really cool. I don't know why it, it took someone so long to kind of come up with that, where you basically factory accessorize a vehicle for this, quote, overlanding crew, where you've got, like, the recovery accessories and then the water accessories and the... The, the wheels that are not necessarily meant to take on dunes, but for like longevity. I think it's a very cool, cool piece of kit. Yeah, you know, I, you know, for me, snorkels are like spoilers, right? They're uh, probably more useful uh, in places that we never take the vehicle to. So in Colorado, we don't necessarily do a lot of water forging. It seems like watching the videos out of Australia uh, and other places like uh, Borneo, right? There's a lot of water fording, but we're not doing a lot of water fording in Colorado. So I guess you get the snorkel up and get the air quality better because there's not a lot of dust. But to me, they seem kind of redundant and silly here. So I never understood them. The winch is, of course, hugely popular, but you can put a winch on any Bronco. You don't need to have an Everglade. 
But um, I, I completely read the the snorkel is is uh, is definitely one of those things that definitely is more looks over actual functionality. However, the overall design of this just looks uh, to be very very cool, yep. and I'm I'm really glad that they did it. Well, I mean, look at those wheels. Look at from Can you the make it bigger. Yeah, from make the factory bigger. picture that they. They kind of tease. The wheels are super cool. They have this almost steely look to them, but but in a more of an alloy finish. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the, look, Ford knocked out of the ballpark with the Bronco. They're kind of uh, hitting, you know, betting a thousand with this thing. And every every new version they do, uh, I like the camo also on it. Actually, it looks really badass in that. Uh, it's just a good looking uh, off roader. I'm not uh, sure the camo is going to stick around. <laughs> yeah, probably not. But it'll be cool. <laughs> the camo camo bronco will be really cool. Plus, the green is good too. This um, this new green that they're offering. And, and you know, when you when you get to the Raptor version of it, those um, fender flares they get almost ridiculously sure like thing. like giant, like almost like oversized. They become very silly. That one actually still looks like they're like two inches that sticking past the body. But you know, the the thing I always keep thinking about the Bronco is like uh, you know we just took a Bronco, and if you want to see that video, Tommy did a great job. We just took a Bronco um, off road and did you know like an eight out of ten um, um, obstacle uh, over at Miller Rock because we you know, nobody couldn't do it. Oh, there you go. Look how far those stick out. Oh my gosh, uh, that's on the Raptor. Uh, but but most people won't be doing that. You know, most people will just be driving it to work or parking it, you know, at their house or the mall. So, you know, yeah, yeah. I wish I wish we, we I wish most people had the opportunity to come to Colorado and experience or, you know, Utah or wherever where there actually is off road experience what that vehicle is built for. The cool thing though is you don't really have to, right? I mean if you just want something that looks cool that you can take Get the, the sport. Top off of. No, I, I mean, I would say just get a standard Bronco without the Sasquatch. Oh, yeah. I mean, take the, take the roof off, take the doors off of. Uh, any Bronco is going to look very, very cool. But I'm, saying, I'm saying if you just want to drive to work, get the Sport. Yeah, but the Sport, you can't, you can't take the roof off of. Mm. You know, I think the convertible is a big, big draw of the Bronco. And that certainly, for me, is one of the things that, that I got excited about. And I completely agree. You're 100% right that it is a shame that, that very few people are going to experience what the locking diffs in the Sasquatch package can offer. But even if you never do, it's still nice being able to have a vehicle with four-wheel drive for the snow. Every Bronco is four-wheel drive. Uh, it's still great having a convertible for the summer times. So lots and lots of kind of versatility on the bandwidth with the new Bronco. Now, the car I'm really looking forward to driving, and you drove it, but you didn't drive the version I'm looking forward to, and that's the new Grand Cherokee 4x the electrified Grand Cherokee, uh, which should take some of the best of the Grand Cherokee, which I think is kind of a sweet spot of the SUV slash crossover world, and make it so that you can actually uh, get good fuel economy with it. I think the, what the Wrangler we had for by he got like in our testing like 27 miles of pure electric range. What are they saying about the Grand Cherokee four by e? To be honest, I'm not sure. I bet you it's going to be similar. I think it's going to be in the 25 to 30 mile range. Yeah, I don't know. I don't remember the specs right off the top of my head. I'd have to look into those. But that seems bit. like a car that is, you know, uh, kind of a perfect fit for people who necessarily, you know, want like all weather capability and may take it on vacation and yet don't need to have like the, the, the you know, the, the ball to the wall uh, off road capability of a Bronco. It seems like it, it's kind of, you know, walks that tightrope in, in a really nice way where you can feel like it's fuel efficient and yet at the same time feel like it's off-road worthy. And then when you do go off-road with it, you got enough range where you can kind of, you know, keep, um, keep, keep uh, nature as the soundtrack versus a big old V8 Hemi. So the car I am really excited to drive. Oh, me too. That's a great one you put up there. In the near future is the fully electric Volkswagen minibus. So the iconic van of like the 60s and 70s. Yeah, it looks like they green lit it. Is making a return with the Volkswagen ID series. So we've seen this concept, which is the uh, like the surfmobile app for a lot, a lot of years, and then nothing has seemed to really come of it. But recent spy shots out of Europe have actually shown what looks to be the production model. It doesn't look quite as cool as the ID Buzz, but it's still very exciting to have the original microbus experience back for the future in an all-electric platform. Yeah, my only question is, why did it take them so long? I remember, I remember seeing that thing roll out at one of the auto shows like five years ago now. Yeah, there was a very slow, <laughs> slow kind of rollout. Yeah, I, I felt like they, as always, they had to do the crossover first, right? I'm also so tired of electric crossovers. 
uh, except for the one that we're about to talk about. But for the most part, there's so many other segments out there where they could be electrifying them. And uh, it looks like our Christmas decorations show a, a nice version of cars that they could be electrifying. Sports cars, convertibles, um, you know, none of that is electrified yet. But is there going to be a market for it? Uh, that's the question, isn't uh, yeah, it? Yeah, I don't know. So, you know, you could be the only electrified convertible versus being one of 400 million electrified crossovers. What's what's more likely to sell? I don't know. That's a good question. Unfortunately, you all out there are not buying convertibles, oh. which is a real shame. Oh, you got your, lo- got your lovely picture there of the new electrified Mini, huh? Yeah, so speaking of new electric cars, I wanted to bring this up. Uh, it's over at tflcar.com. Nathan wrote it up. It looks like a startled uh, mole. <laughs> you, don't, you don't like the design? The eyes are so big, doesn't it? It looks like a startled mole. Well, uh, Nathan wrote up a story about the brand new Mini Hatchback, the little Mini Cooper, which, of course, we were big fans of over here. Nathan, uh, basically someone on Twitter, took pictures of an uncamouflaged version of the upcoming Mini Hatchback. Here, here, here try. Is this... <laughs> That what was that? That's the that's what it looks like. I think it's kind of cute. It's got kind of a cool look to it. You don't think so? <laughs> well, I mean, I'm, I'm a startled mole could be fun, I guess. I mean, it, you know, I mean, they can be whimsical with the thing. I mean, I think that the front end, the headlights are ridiculously well, and large. Well, the mouth is huge. But look at the tail. The tail the is really cool. good. I like the tail. Yeah. And the interior's got this kind of funky floating screen going and, on. And by the way, guys, if you're interested in finding out these, this is a video and you want to see what we're talking about, you're welcome to go to tfl-studio.com where we put all of our TikToks, all of our videos, all of our podcasts. And then you can actually, if you were listening to this, you can actually see what we're talking about. But basically, the eyes are really big. The mouth is really open. Uh, and then, of course, in the back, they've gone with the latest design, which is, you know, a, a straight line across the back, which everybody's doing now for some reason. It's the latest and greatest thing that people are um, people are doing. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's evolutionary. It's certainly not not revolutionary. Well, I'm actually excited. If you think, not to correct you, Deb, but I think yeah. if you look closely, yeah. there isn't a horizontal light bar on this one. Well, it's a line. I'm just saying it's a big line. It, whether it's light bar. Oh, I see what you're saying. And the other thing they're saying is, every, you know, the other other trend that you guys will be noticing by now is, like, everybody's putting the name of the car across its butt. So whether it's, you know, Pathfinder in big, giant letters yeah. or... Uh, what, what does that one say? I can't see it from here. What would you guess it would say? Uh, is it say Countryman or... No, Cooper. Cooper. Cooper yeah. There and it big, is. Big, giant letters. Yeah, <laughs> Cooper, of course. There it is. So very excited about the the Mini Cooper. I think that the the new one will be very cool. But touching back on the ID Buzz, the the little Volkswagen van electrified, very very interesting idea. Volkswagen is of course all in electrification with the ID Four series and now the ID Five, and the ID Buzz is finally the departure from the electric crossover that you're sick of. So something a little bit different, maybe something that you can camp in, maybe something you can take the kids to school in. Very, very cool. Now, there's a bunch of trucks we're also looking forward to driving, but uh, I'll leave those to Andre in uh, his podcast, TFL Truck Talk. So since we're talking cars, we'll leave those to Andre. One more we forgot to mention. Uh, uh, what's another car we are looking forward the to? The Kia EV6. Yeah. Well, you just drove the um, you just drove the EV5, which we'll be talking about next, but the EV6 is also coming and I, I suspect an EV7, EV8, and an EV9 eventually. Well, I drove the Ionic 5. Yeah. So the EV series is the Kia. Right. Um, e- yeah, so the EV6 is the Kia's version of the Ionic 5. And there's an EV6 GT, which I saw at the Chicago Auto Show this summer, which is supposed to be like the, 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 the fast one. Yeah, like 0 to 16, well under 4 seconds. Now, these cars ride on what they call the e, E-Gump. E-Gump? Yeah, E-G-M-P platform. Okay. So underneath the Kia and the Hyundai, very similar, but the Kia is a little bit more sporty, a little bit more squat down and fast back looking. But this thing is supposed to be an absolute ripper. As you mentioned, the GT looks to be seriously quick performer. It looks like something out of Tron. The overall design is just beautiful. Hey, what time did you say the embargo on the Ionic 5 pricing is? It's at 1 o'clock p.m. Um, Pacific time. I think we can talk about it. I think we're close enough. So that is... Let's break some news here, Tommy. Two o'clock our time. Yeah, and I think by the time we get this podcast up, we'll be we'll be certainly within the... And by the time you listen to it, by the time you get to like minute 20 of this thing, we'll be well within... We don't, you know, we don't break... That's a whole other topic for us. But we don't break embargoes. It's, you know, embargo basically means that the... Uh, we've agreed with the manufacturer that they'll give us early access to information. Uh w- with the caveat that we you know we'll publish it when they deem us to publish it, so that every media outlet can publish it at the same time. So I think I think we're pretty safe uh, to to talk about it. So 
Before we talk about the pricing, um, are, are the driving impressions still embargoed? They are, yes. Okay, so we can't talk about those, but you can certainly talk about what you thought of the, of, of the new Hyundai. So let's talk about it. Now, yeah. the Ionic 5 is, once again, a crossover, barely. Mm -hmm. I'm not really sure I agree with that, but it's considered a crossover vehicle built to compete with cars like the Ford Mustang Mach-E, the electric Mustang crossover. ID4. The Volkswagen ID4. And then, of course, a big player in the room is the oh, Tesla boy. Model Y. Now, the Ionic 5 is probably one of the coolest looking cars I've ever seen. Uh, if you're listening to this podcast, pause and go look up a picture of the Ionic 5 because it looks like a 1980s Lancia Delta Integrale uh, that's been modernized by the folks over at Tron. And I keep wow, good description. I keep seeing it in pictures. I saw it in person, and I'm like, "That's a great concept car." But when is the actual production coming? One, uh, when is the production one coming? And this is how it's going to look. I know it's it's like they took once again they took a concept car and put it into production. Uh, it's got a lot of little squares. You can tell in the light, right? That, that's kind of this this pattern that it uses, like little tiny geometrical patterns that are sprinkled throughout the entire design of it, including the really cool taillights. They're kind of like little pixels is, yeah. is like a way to look at them. But, but, very... but isn't the pixel a square? Yeah, but I think that's the idea. Yeah. Like, isn't Ionic like a... A pixel? Well, it feels like it's something to do with optics. And right, pixel yeah. Is, a, yeah, yeah. is a good way of looking at that. But the Ionic 5, genuinely, it's got this kind of squinty front end with this very angular curve down the side. Uh, it's squared off at the back. It has an insanely long wheelbase. The wheelbase is longer than a 2020 Chevrolet Tahoe, even though the overall car is roughly the same size as a Tesla. And you know, when is your driving impression video coming to TFL Car? So it's coming on Friday the 17th. Okay. If you want to know how it drives, but we can talk about everything else. Yeah, let's let's talk about the fact that uh, it has some really interesting and unique features. I think one of the more interesting ones is that it's got a wheelbase that is longer than a Range Rover. Yeah, that's what I just said. Yeah. Yeah, longer than a Tahoe. So what they did basically is pull the the Sir Alec is a Gonus. Yeah, out of the original Mini. Yeah, they stuck the wheels way at the corners, which gave it a very cool look, but also gives you tons of room on the inside. Imagine a giant Mini. Kind of like a giant a mini. A maxi mini. But the design is like 80s Golf GTI or yeah. Rabbit GTI. Yeah. So they did that, and then they stuck the battery on the floor, 77.4 kilowatt hours. Okay. What, got, what's good? What's what's that range-wise? What does that translate to? So the official EPA driving range is mm -hmm. 256 miles for the all-wheel drive one. Yeah, it's right in the middle. 303 miles for the long-range rear-wheel drive one. And then the interesting thing, which they did not actually tell us on the program, but just came out, is there's going to be a standard range model as well with 220. So 220, 256, and 303. Uh, and that's going to be rear-wheel drive or front-wheel drive? Rear-wheel drive. Well, that's good. I'm, I'm really really confounded, Tommy, by all these manufacturers, and that includes Polestar, now that are doing two-wheel drive versions of their car that are front-wheel drive. It makes no sense. Why wouldn't you go, like, you know, let the front wheel steer and let the rear wheels push? Why would you, once again, when you don't have to, look, if you, if you package a vehicle with a traditional internal combustion engine, it makes a lot of sense to make it front-wheel drive because that's where the engine lives usually, right? Yep. But if the engine lives wherever you want it to live because it's a motor, it's an electric motor, why not make it? So I'm glad that the Ionic went the way of rear-wheel drive, two-wheel drive versus front-wheel drive, two-wheel drive. Well, what about this argument? If you are going to power just two wheels, yep. wouldn't it make sense to power the front-wheel drive? Because to the average consumer, it's going to be easier and better in the snow. Actually, I've heard that it's not. I've heard that it's not because the, the, what makes the car, a traditional front-wheel drive car, better in the snow is the weight of the engine sitting over the front wheels. But when you remove that big chunk of metal and you just put a small motor, right? So an engine is like, you know, if you can't see my arms are like like spread out. But, you know, a motor can be the size of a fat basketball, right? Right, yeah. yeah. So, so now you're losing the added traction of having all that weight over the front wheels. So, yeah, I'm not sure in an electric car whether... Uh, front wheel drive makes it better in the snow. And if you live in Florida or California, who gives a rats? I do think there is, so, I, that's a very great point you brought up. I do think there is some viability in the argument that to an average driver in the snow, it's safer to have a vehicle understeer, which front wheel drive will do, versus oversteer, which is what rear wheel drive will do, like in the i3. Yeah, but all that is washed away by the fact that you've got the front wheels both steering and pulling, 
right? It makes for a weird, like, it's like, eh. it's just, you know, like torque steer and all the other stuff that comes along with front wheel drive that you don't get with rear wheel drive. There's something very satisfying about having the rear wheels do the hard work while the front wheels do the easy work of steering the car. The other potential, which Hyundai told me a while back, but now is kind of contradicting their own arguments, is that in front wheels, uh, when you're talking about regeneration, mm -hmm. right, regenerative braking, when you're slowing down, you're applying more um, weight to the front end of the car, which is where the front wheels are, and you can potentially get more regen out of the front wheels than out of the rear wheels, because you can't lock up the rear wheels, right? That would be a really dangerous situation, whereas in the fronts, you got more potential drag capability. So anyways, I do agree with you, though. I think rear wheel drive is, is the way to go. I'm not, I'm just, just playing devil's advocate. So. 256 miles for the all-wheel drive, which is less than the Tesla, right? I think the Model Y is rated at 320. Yeah, so with Teslas, uh, you know, those numbers are very <laughs> squishy. So, like, I can I can tell you that the car that I drove, the Porsche Taycan, right, uh, the range is, like, in the 220. I drove the new GTS. The range is officially in the, like, 220 range. Yep. But most... People who test it get much further than that. With Tesla, it's always a little squishy, so you don't know, right? The Germans tend to underrate, whereas I think Tesla tends to um, Twitterize all their numbers, <laughs> if, that's, if it's a good way of putting it. Uh, the other thing that, that, that is impressive about this vehicle is I think it's got a charge rate of 230 kilowatts, which is getting up there, right? Allegedly, it's quicker than the Tesla Model Y, even on the fastest well, because it's an 800-volt system. Yeah, so even if you go to the fastest, what is it, V3 supercharger? Yeah, 350 kilowatts. Uh, V3 might be 250. Is it? I think V3 might be 250. Someone will let us know in the comment section. But if you take the Ionic, so of course the Ionic, you can't use a Tesla supercharger. Right. You have to go to like an Electrify America. But if you take an Ionic to the quickest Electrify America station, 350 kilowatts, right. they say 0 to 80% in 18 minutes. Yeah, but that number, for all you guys... <laughs> that are listening to this, you'll probably know is if you're new to this podcast, the manufacturers love, 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 love to talk about the time it takes to uh, charge a car from zero to 80% because obviously the last 20% is, um, is, is it take twice or three times as long as the first 80%, literally, right? Yep. Uh, but that number is so deceptive as we found out when we tried towing with the Tesla when you actually have to charge it up 200%. So there are times when you want to completely charge it. So I, I, that number to me is all but meaningless. It's just a marketing number. The number that I'm most interested in is, you know, what's the highest rate and for how long can it hold that rate? Well, that kind of ties into the 0 to 80% though because the, the higher you can hold the peak rate, the quicker the car will charge. And I didn't have a chance to, to charge the car on this this quick trip because yep. I was too busy doing videos. But I talked to some of my colleagues that, that did. Yep. And it sounds like this thing is a really impressive, um, really impressive fast charging vehicle. I, I, I was talking to some of them and they were talking like times that were just blowing my mind. So very excited to actually see what this car is like to charge here in Colorado when we get it back to. So, so I just put up a TikTok today. Okay. Uh, charging, so we did, we drove Angela's Crest uh, in the Porsche GTS um, Taycan and uh, one of the journalists there, Bas Basim, I think Basim, that's how I pronounce his name, yeah. Uh, got it down to 9% before we got to the charger. I didn't go quite as low. Uh -huh. He must have been driving much faster than me, but then again, I was feeling pretty yucky. I think I got food poisoning on my trip, which I paid the price for this weekend. Anyway, um, he uh, got to the charging station, Electrify America, the 350 kilowatt one, plugged it in, and I saw uh, 254 kilowatts going into his car, which wow. is pretty amazing. And then the Porsche has this little thing where you could push a little uh, button and it shows you what that translates to in miles per minute so he was getting 11 miles per minute of of, of range oh, at really? 254 but that was from nine percent i mean what i mean was there was nine percent of the battery left gotcha yeah so that that's pretty impressive and i stuck around for like well, I stuck around as long as I could because I had to go to the bathroom, but I stuck around oh, as Jesus. long as I could, which was like 10 minutes. Uh, and it went from like 250 to 251, 253, 254. So for like a good four or five minutes there, it was at least holding that number. I was talking to some folks on my trip, and they said uh, there was like an opportunity to charge. And they said that, that the highest speed I heard was like 230 was what someone hit which is very, very, very good. Now, now, for all of you internal combustion engine guys and gals, this may seem like a strange language, but you might as well learn it or maybe not tune out on it because it is coming. It really is like what, you know, used to be zero to 60 times. This is this is really what now 
is becoming the, the, the way that electric cars are judged in terms of their performance. Because it's not just about how quick the car is driving, but how quick you can charge it, right? Because nobody thinks about that when you pull up to the gas station and 45 seconds later you're full. But you certainly do think about that when it can take you anywhere from, you know, 20 minutes on the low end to an hour and a half on the long end to charge your car. So speaking of numbers, they might and understand. That's, and that's a fast charger. Speaking of numbers, they might understand. Horsepower yeah. rating, 320 in the dual motor car. Zero to 60 Hyundai says 5.1 seconds. As you talked about, 800 volt uh, charging infrastructure. Tesla's still on a 400. But the craziest part about this vehicle is the pricing was just released. And it looks to be um, one of the, the, the best deals on the market. Well, let's talk about it. Go for it. All right. So the base price. Thirty-nine thousand seven hundred before tax credits. Yep, uh, that's that's, that's really good for uh, what I think is a stunning car that uh, that will be unobtainium, unfortunately, because they're only selling it in the kind of the, the states on the on the coast, right? They're only selling it in the best states. So California, Washington, Oregon, and then going down the other coast, New York, yada yada. yada. Are we sure that that's not going to change quickly, though? They said they're going to change, change, but uh, initially they're only selling it in those states. But that doesn't mean you can't, you know, hopefully pick one up in uh, California and drive it home if you live in places like here. So 39000 base, the long-range rear-wheel drive with 300 miles of range starts at 43, and then the all-wheel drive one starts at 47, which is very, very attractive. Keep in mind that we're talking, in some cases here, like $20,000 less than the entry-level Model Y. Yeah, the Model Y, uh, you know, Tesla's been doing this thing where uh, you wake up and then the, both the Model 3 and the Model Y are like $3,000 more expensive. And the Model Y has gotten really expensive, really expensive. And don't think that like the the options on the Hyundai are any less impressive than the Model Y. So if you get like a limited model like we had, right, you're going to be in the $54,500 range. But we had the same type of autopilot like Tesla has. So it's got lane centering assist. It's got adaptive cruise control that will learn your driving habits. So it actually has AI in it now. So if it knows that you like to speed up quickly when you're following someone after a car merges, it'll do the same. Yeah. So here's here. Let's just I'll take a step back. Here's the problem with full self driving and autopilot. They aren't. That's it's as simple as that. Neither of those are level five autonomy. And level five, there's five level, level, levels of autonomy. And level five means that the car can drive itself with no human driver at the control under any weather conditions. And we are so far from that, Tommy. So right now what we're talking about are level two, which basically means the car can drive itself on an interstate given the correct weather and given the fact that a human is there and has his hands on the wheel. So once again, Full self-driving, autopilot, aren't. So they're level two, just like Hyundai's. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so, so yeah, my point is they're basically... They're like, driver assistants. Yeah, it's like, like, like you can compare... We, we've driven every manufacturer's version of lane keeping, which is basically a better way of talking about it. It's, it's lane centering, right? It keeps you in the center of the lane. Uh, and then maybe if, if, if you're really pushing the bounds, it'll actually turn um, shift cha shift lanes for you by itself, right? So when you signal, it'll actually find the hole and move over. Well, guess what the Hyundai will do? It'll do that. Find the hole and move over. It's got yeah. automatic lane changing. But even cooler than that, which I wanted to talk about really quickly, is the AI systems will know that if a truck is next to you, it will actually change that center of the lane a little bit and shift it to the left, right? So if you're passing a truck, it knows the lane positioning right, beyond but that, but, just centering. But that, that is very far from driving itself. So oh, I, for sure. So where I was going is, you know, like whether it's GM's version of that, right, which is Super Cruise, or Ford's version of that, which is Blue Cruise, right, or Tesla's version of that, which is full self-driving. And for all you Tesla fans, before you start yelling at whatever you're – listening to this on. I understand there's a beta version. We're well aware of that, that there's a beta version that, that apparently is just a train wreck where most people on YouTube have shown that not only doesn't it work as advertised, but it's outright dangerous. It does very dangerous things like try to you know, drive you into traffic or, or you know, give up at the most inappropriate moment. So I'm not talking about the beta version that some people got to test. I'm talking about like what is out there, what most people can use. Uh, and and I found very little difference between, you know, the different systems. The older systems ping pong you back and forth between lanes, right? So they don't necessarily, they, they lane keep, but they don't lane center. The better systems actually lane center. Uh, 
but none of them are autonomous in any stretch of the imagination where you could like just you know put your hands behind your head and hit the button and, and let the car drive you home or let the car drive you across the country. You are still going to have to, in some ways it's actually worse because it gives you a false sense of safety when you know the thing goes into emergency braking at, at, at the most inappropriate times or like says like with the Subaru we had right if you start the speed limit on the highway going up to uh, Keystone is 75 or oh, 65 right and yet when you get into that twisty bit right before you get to Idaho Springs the system can't maintain that so it'll give up so you know we're living in like uh, interesting times but but having tested all these systems, I would say, you know, the promise and the reality are far apart. Except for one. Okay, what's that? Except for one. And you kind of glanced over it, but this is a very important distinction to make. So the Hyundai, the lane centering, you have to have a hand on the steering wheel. Right. The BMW, hand on the steering wheel. The Tesla, hand on the steering wheel. Well, you can fake it. That's what no, Tesla no, hang on. But, you, but, but uh, you know what I mean. Like, it, right. you need to have a hand on the steering right. wheel. Super Cruise, no hands on the steering wheel. As long as you're on a pre-mapped highway, which is a lot of the major highways. Well, well in the Super US. Cruise looks at your eyes, and it's amazing. It is. I actually did try it in the Escalade we had going yeah. down our highway here, 36. I mean, it's incredible. Like hands off the steering wheel for as long as you want. It's looking at your eyes, making sure you're paying attention. Yeah, and then you get then you get this other problem that I was trying to describe, which is it lulls you into a false sense of security. Right, where, right. Where it, it work, let's say it works like ninety percent of the time. Or let's let's be let's be generous. Ninety nine percent of the time. Well, that's why you need to be alert and paying and, attention. And, and but the way humans are is you 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 go from like this thing is great and it's wonderful to kind of checking out and starting to check your texts or starting to you know zone out with your brain and then that one percent happens and you're in trouble. Yeah, I agree. There's a potential there. But Super Cruise was amazing. The new Blue Cruise by Ford is supposed to have the same functionality where you can do hands off. And I know there's like a lot of potential to get in a lot of trouble, but as long as you're paying attention, as long as you're alert, that super cruise system and that Escalade. I think we're in for a rocky road to level five. That's, that's all I'm saying. I, I agree. I think we're in for a rocky road. But let's have a little positivity here. Not every car needs a crank start anymore. No, man. no, Do you know no, what I mean? no, I, no, no. I'm, I'm being negative <laughs> because I, I'm just my the journalist inside of me is reacting very badly to full self driving and well, that's, autopilot. That is, uh, full self driving is just total deceptive naming, and right. I think that isn't right. And, and so yeah, so you're right. Yeah, I, I don't mean to be like I think these systems when they work are really convenient and are really um, like like you know it, it's what we were promised or what I was promised when I was a kid actually coming to fruition. But I kind of feel like the government has you know taken its hands off the wheel and has allowed us with our lives and our family lives to be beta testers on this. You're absolutely right. And that's what that's that's why I'm so cautionary and a little skeptical and certainly a little worried about like the potential of where this is all going. But let's talk about like what the Hyundai does. So right. it's got lane centering. Yep. So you have to have a hand on the steering wheel. You have to be paying attention. But the car will maintain the lane position, adaptive cruise control, maintain the distance. So essentially it is cruising along at the set speed that you set it to and will follow the lane. Right. Very cool. And it also changed lanes. I think that that is a very cool Cool piece of tech. You still have your hand on the steering wheel, you still have to be alert, but it will do a lot of the heavy lifting. And then there's a lot of life saving tech that the Hyundai brings into it, which other manufacturers are doing as well. So you've heard of automatic emergency braking, right? It saved my butt, it's probably saved your butt, right? A car stops I, I, in front I, of you. I think we're getting to the point now where like autonomous braking, especially when you're backing up, has probably saved a lot of people's lives. Yeah, and and I think forward but slow slow situations. But even speed, forward yeah. collision, like I've been in situations where like I'll be looking out the window, the car in front of me stops. So, so my experience with like has been mixed, right? So sometimes it's been good. Like say I've been zoned out and I've not been paying attention and all of a sudden it goes to full on emergency braking. Uh, and that's been really good because it has, like I saved my bacon, but there have been times when it's done the exact opposite. It's so like when we were driving the Tesla from Denver and twice it went under our underpass and it went into full emergency braking and I almost got rammed from behind by a Subaru who was too close to my butt. And if I hadn't accelerated, I would have been hit because the car thought that the shadow of the bridge was actually a car in front of me where it wasn't. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, same thing happened to me uh, coming here where the car way too early went into full emergency braking because what, the car, what car in front was this? Now, this was a Ford product. Okay. It went it went like it went full on, you know, the light came on, uh, the car was making a left turn and then the car behind me almost hit me and this was like I'm like I know the guy in front of me is turning. I get it. I I can stop the car myself. So uh, so yeah, it's it's a little bit of a mixed bag in some point. Well, it's technology needs needs, you know, a couple more years to be fully matured. I think automatic emergency braking is totally there. I mm -hmm. think it is 
Um, very, very, I think it is life-saving equipment, and I'm really glad it's happening. And then Hyundai has stepped it up a notch, too. For example, here in Boulder, we have a lot of cyclists, a lot of bicyclists, and, and the most common death on a bicycle is going straight through an intersection and someone turns left in front of you and, yep. and hits you. The Hyundai now has technology where it'll look out for situations like that. That's and great. Can hit its brakes yeah, for... I'm, I'm so help- but I think Volvo... I think Volvo was one of the first companies well, that so was looking for cyclists. A, a, lot, a of, lot of companies will do it going forward. Right. But when you're going left, yeah, I know. that's a whole other can of worms. Yeah. So yeah. I'm very glad that – I do agree with you that a lot of the, quote, autonomous tech is underbaked and potentially hazardous. So, look, last year, the news, last week, the news was that Mercedes was the first company that got uh, German government um, okay to actually go – and use autonomous driving, such as it is on the German autobahn. They beat Tesla to it. Mm-hmm. Why? Why are we doing beta testing with you know uh, a group of fanboys and girls? Why isn't the government doing what Germany is doing and and, and putting our lives in danger with with this stuff? I it's mean, a good question. I don't know. I wish I had I mean, the answer. Look, yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Uh, at some point, you know, I don't like the government. You know, being over intrusive, but this is like this is like dangerous stuff. You know, that if it goes wrong. People's lives are at risk. Do we really have to have uh, like civil litigation putting this kind of genie back in the bottle, right? By the time you get to civil, in other words, let's say you know an accident happens and then lawyers get involved and not the government, but people start suing each other, right? At that point, people have died. It's too late. So anyway, I, I, I don't understand why our government isn't isn't cracking down on this and like you know having set rules of what is legal and what is illegal. And I think that would be good for all the manufacturers, right? We've seen it with crash testing, right? Where you've got where you've got uh, serious testing of what the manufacturer claims. And at some point, our jobs, I hope, is to hold kind of the company's feet to the fire and say, if your time, if you say your time is zero to 60, but we certainly don't have the expertise to do full self-driving or crash testing. That That is beyond our ability or our capability. So a couple other things about the Hyundai yep, before we move on. Mm-hmm. I think that the um, front trunk is lacking, so there is this hilarious little. Uh, <laughs> it's but there's like a frunk. It, it, there's the it, EQS has no frunk. It's a frubby. Okay. All right, but yeah, it's, it's not a front trunk. It's a front cover. So, so you lift up the hood of the Ionic, and there's like a plastic engine cover. You lift that up, and there's like one cubic foot worth of space, which maybe will hold the charge cable and a couple of hot dogs. But it's like a front cubby, so I call it a frubby. I was trying to wrap my head around why, like Mercedes and their new EQS. You drove the we driven so EQS is their new electric S class, right? Yep. And it looks like a giant jelly bean. It's very aerodynamic. Uh, some people love it. Some people hate it. Um, I drove the AMG version, which is, of course, the hot performing version of that. But the, the, the most confounding thing is you can't open the, the front, right? As you can with – same thing with BMW, right? So the Germans have gone to this thing where and, – and they've had to, like, do weird stuff because you can't open the front, uh, which is, like, like, on the side of the car is this little uh, pop-out uh, – what would you call it? For your windshield wiper fluid, it's a it's a channel. It's, it's a little channel that pops out where you can pour your windshield wiper fluid in because you can't open it, the front to get at the little container. Right. Uh, why not just open the front? I mean, even in the mini, right? We got the mini SE. There's nothing under there, but at least you can like get at it. Yeah, I think that the German manufacturers like Mercedes and BMW want to maybe make it like a seamless experience where you never have to stare at big scary orange wires and you never have to look at wiring and. And bits of, you know. Yeah, but then you have to, like, how about if you want to, like I said, fill out your windshield wiper fluid? But they came up with cool solutions. So, like, I love this on the BMW iX. You push in on the BMW logo, it pops open and reveals a tube where you mm-hmm. pour in the windshield fluid. Yeah, until, until you know, you're driving. Here's, here's the other problem with that, right? You're driving through Wyoming in the middle of winter with freezing rain, and you run out of windshield wiper fluid. You pull into the gas station, and you find out that that little cool feature has now frozen shut, and you can't get windshield wiper fluid into it. It's a potential, but they have pretty, they have pretty cold winters in Germany. I think they plan for that. You think it's heated? You think? I you think, think it is uh-huh. actually because the sensors on the front of the BMW are heated. Keep that in mind too. So they're heating the sensors in a lot of cases. I don't know if it's exactly in the iX, but on a lot of cars, they're heating like the the adaptive cruise sensors. So um, look, the the argument here is what you can't open is not a concern for the consumer. Because what are you really going to be servicing under the hood of your hundred thousand dollar electric yeah, Mercedes S Class? Like the thing about right, open, like the, they, first of all, we should explain that the hood will open 
but only with the it's, dealer access. You have to have a special tool that the dealer has to open the hood. Right. So what what do you really need underneath that hood? You know what I mean? It goes to the like the right to repair kind of thing, right? Yeah, but, uh, like, yeah. You feel like you, like once again you feel like you're not buying it, but you're leasing it. It's not really yours. To me, like first like, of all, you, electric you, you, cars you, very rarely break that. There's not much to I'm break. I'm just saying to me, cars. when you own something, you, you you should be allowed to get into every bit of it. Yes, it's different on a phone. I get it. Like on a phone, you can't open the back, pop the back. But there's just so much back there that I don't understand. That I don't want to understand. That I'm good with it. But in my car, I really enjoyed like. As a car guy, like, you know, bringing the garage and popping the hood and then spending, you know, some time looking at the way that the car was designed, the way that everything works in there, it kind of allowed me to feel like the thing belongs to me versus it's just an appliance that, that the manufacturer thinks I'm too stupid to comprehend. But that That's kind of the signal it's sending. Like the engineers are saying, this is either too dangerous or too overly complicated or you, you shouldn't care about this. And it doesn't feel like it's mine. It feels like it's something that the manufacturer is just leasing me for a few years and only the dealer can service. I, I, it's confounding. I don't know about you, but I am too stupid to understand most of it. Like, I don't know what, what a DC to DC inverter would look like or what, um, you, you know, the, the battery the battery management software where that lives. And then I think from a practical point of view, I think a frunk is hugely, like, usable. So, you know, with a Tesla or um, any other vehicle, let's say you're going to, I'm just going to give you a, for example, right? You're going to our favorite Indian place and that Indian stuff smells up, it smells wonderful, but man, the car smells like Indian for the next three days. If you can throw that in the front, as opposed to in the back where you're part of a hatchback where it's still in the car and keep that smell out of the car, it's wonderful. Or, you know, the obvious other use cases, like you're in California and you've got a wetsuit and you need to throw it someplace like with the Mach-E, it's got the removable little uh, tabs where anything wet can go in the front and then pours out the bottom. It's just a very useful space. Why wouldn't you design Maybe not that tiny cubby you were talking about in the attic, but, you know, something that would hold, let's say, a roller bag. Yeah, so what we're dealing with here are two different things. So on the Mini Cooper SE, you can open the hood, and it's just wires and pipes and no storage. Right. On the Tesla, you open the hood, there's no wires and pipes, but there is storage. On the Mercedes EQS, you can't open the hood at all, and there's no storage, obviously, because you can't get in there. Now, I appreciate the concept of a frunk, and you are 100% right. Like Indian food, you don't want it to smell. The Mach-E, you can use it as a cooler. But I will also say this. We owned three Teslas over the course of three years, and I think I saw you use that frunk maybe twice. Whenever we went grocery shopping, you always use the underfloor storage in the back. Whenever we had the dog, obviously he was in the back. Whenever we had stuff, it was always in the trunk or under the floor in the but trunk. I, I used it to keep like our charger when I needed the charger. It, it was a nice cubby to have for like our... Sure. Uh, you know, so I, I used it to not only store stuff, so I didn't use it like every day, but I, I did store stuff in there or I think I stored like my winter like survival kit in front there. Uh, the, but you know, it was very, here, very rarely used. Here, here's the other thing I would say. So I've been listening to this podcast, you know, Johnny Smith uh, and the guy who used to be one of the producers on uh, Top Gear. I think it's called Smith and Sniff. Okay. There used to be a website called uh, Sniff Petrol. I might still be around. Anyway, uh, they do a thing, and they were talking about this, and, I, and I'm going to kind of expound on it if that's okay. Like in the early days, right, those – Bronze era cars, remember those? Sure. Right, like a lot of them had controls outside of the of the car. They were open cars, but like like the the control was not in the footwell, but on the outside of the footwell, right? So they had levers, big old levers on the outside here, brakes on the outside, mm -hmm. and then somebody at some point said, "You know what? Let's take the accelerator and move it into the cabin as opposed to having it outside of the cabin, right? Yeah. Same thing with the brake. And somebody said, "You know what? Let's make a front." Uh, a front uh, hood that opens up because it's useful and, you know, with the way car design works, this is the most uh, logical and, like, the most obvious way to do things. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's, it'd be like car manufacturers deciding, you know what, let's move the emergency brake back outside of the car, right? That's what they're doing. And I don't understand why, like, this hundred and some years of automotive history is going out the window and car manufacturers have decided that now, as an owner of the car, I can't open up the, uh, the hood. I don't get that. Like I say, to me, it's, it's illogical. That's why it's confounding. Like I say, it'd be like, let's take the emergency brake and throw it out outside the window so that you have to reach outside to, to activate it. Well, in a brass era car, you were working on that engine on every drive. You know, on every drive, you were changing the uh, the mixture of the carburetor. You were working, you were fussing with the dynamo. Those were cars that you had to have a knowledge of and an experience of just to drive. 
Um, and then, of course, cars got better. Right, and then in the '60s, um, you know, maybe you still needed to know how the carburetor worked. Maybe and, and I would say knew, needed to know how to. Can I explain though? Yes, yeah. how to change a spark Please, plug. Sorry. But nowadays, on an EQS, you're going to need a supercomputer just to do anything on the car. Right. So why do you need access to the the the, the greasy bits underneath the hood? I would say cars are getting worse. I would say that. Oh, the, they are not getting worse. I, I would say that. The, I would say that. I'll give you a good example. I would say that the yoke, and I haven't driven it, so. You know, I could be talking out of my, you know what here, but I have watched a lot of videos. I have, you know, seen a lot of reviews, and I think that the new yoke on the Model X, Model S, has made cars worse. It I, hasn't made them better. It has the, made them worse. The yoke is ridiculous, but I think it's a broad. You're painting with a broad brush. I'll give you. I'll give you cars. more examples if you want. I think that uh, the new um, ways that cars shift into gear has made them worse. I think it, it, you know that 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 typical whatever it was park drive reverse worked really well and now they've gone the germans have gone to all kinds of silly ways of you know making that and and, and all of it is worse uh, and not better i i disagree because I, it's, 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 can i can i say one yeah, thing on that yeah it's great saying oh i miss my shifter down in the console and then you're complaining well there's nowhere to put my cup holders why does that why is there a big lump on my floor where i can't put my purse or i'll, my, give, my you, I'll give you an example of how it's worse so uh, because so Jeep, of course, um, and a lot of manufacturers do this now, where if you put the car in reverse, right, because of the way that the, the new shifters work, because people are unfamiliar with them, right, they they do not know if the car is in drive, they don't know if it's in, and I've, I've seen you must have happened to you, right, where you don't know if the car is actually in gear or not. That, has that happened to you? No, you, I, it's I, never I, happened to you. I where, always know what gear. Yeah, it's my always, every, oh, it's my on. responsibility as a driver you, to know uh, you, what you gear. Pull up to a, you pull up. You're hurrying to visit some friends, or you're late to lunch, and you put it, and you and you and, and you think you put it in park, but you haven't, or you've hit that stop start button, and you haven't turned it off because you haven't pushed it long enough, or whatever. You've never had that happen. So what I will say on the matter, and this is why cars are better. If I forget to put your Mini Cooper SE in the park, I get out the door, the car will turn itself off. The car will automatically engage its parking brake. The car will not roll away. If I get the new Grand Cherokee and I forget to put it in park, I open the door. It'll engage you know, that parking brake. You know what else brake. the car will do? You know what? And many cars will do this now because what? of this this wonderful new world that we live in. What? If you want to pull up to, let's say, a, a tight spot, which minis are good at, uh, and you want to back up and make sure you don't curb a wheel, the second you put it in reverse and you open the door, it'll put it itself in park. The se and it'll do that while you're backing up. That's so let's, true. Let's yes, say you can't you, have the door open while backing up. Let's say you're backing up and then you're like, oh, I don't want to curb my wheel. You open the door, bam, that car will stop and you'll get thrown back because it'll put itself in park. Yeah, I, I, but think about the number of lives and accidents you're saving by putting the car in park by opening the door. I would argue you shouldn't be driving with the door open. I would, I would argue that for 20 years, people knew how to back their cars up and we were okay. People and you would, were also, you would also argue these newfangled radial tires without tubes in them. I no, miss the no, days no, when I'm the gonna, wooden I'm wheels, you could fix them with the hammer. No, I just, the hammer. No, I just, the I'm argument just, that... I'm just saying the reason that the cars have to do that is because they re designed the way that you put the car in drive and park and it conf and turned it off and on. It confused so many people that people were actually unaware that the car was still in gear or in neutral or still running when they got out of the car because they were so confounded by the, you know, the, the number of changes that happened very quickly in a matter of a short time. So people like the guy from Star Trek, right, got run over by their Jeep uh, because he thought the car was, you know, in, in, in park when That's it was That's right. And now they will automatically engage the parking brake because of situations like that. I will actually make the opposite argument. The only time I have missed park in a vehicle was I had an old Wrangler that had a column mounted automatic transmission and reverse and park were so close next to each other in that mechanical linkage where sometimes I would go into reverse, get out in the car would start oh, to was roll away. It was worn out. But my point is, look, that this whole argument that new cars are worse than old cars, I love old cars. Pretty much every car I own was built before like 1980. But I think no, the I, reason... I didn't, I didn't say they're worse. I said they're making them worse. They're not making them worse because listen to this. The Hyundai Ioniq 5 has a 10-year, 100,000-mile powertrain warranty. 10 years, 100,000 miles. The battery warranty, 10 years, 100,000 miles. That EQS you drove has a 15-year battery warranty. 
You want to talk about worse? Cars from the 80s had like a 90-day warranty. I don't know those. They had a 100-day warranty. I don't know, I don't know those brass era cars are still driving around and they didn't have a warranty on them and they're still around. I mean, you, you I, yes, I mean, internal you can make the com- I guess if you're going to go there, I'm going to say the internal combustion engine, you know, whether it's got a warranty or not, it'll probably has been proved to last 100 years. You could go back it's, and uh, forth. And oh, so my I, 1965 Volkswagen's still running. Yeah, but it's completely rusted out because it had no rust. And, and I promise you, Tommy, that EQS as well as a GTS 20 years from now is going to be a, a doorstop. Would you rather get in an accident in a new EQS or but, but that's, 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 class? But that's a whole different... No, thing. I think it is. If you want no, to have the argument that old cars are better, would you rather no, get in no, an accident no, with no, no, no airbags? No, I, no, I said they're making them worse. I didn't say they're better. That There's a distinction there. Making them worse. So new cars yes. are worse than what they're making, cars. I'm saying 20 years from now or 30 years from now, you will not be able to drive that uh, Taycan GTS. You will not be able because the battery technology will be so far ahead. It's like it's like an iPhone 1, right? I mean, it's a cool little piece of history, but no one's using it for real. But a lot of people are using 20-year-old cars or 10-year-old cars. 20-year-old electric cars are going to be valueless. Maybe there, you know, maybe maybe if we're lucky, there might be because the cars depends on scarcity and resources. You know, there might be an aftermarket situation where companies will come and retrofit batteries into these, you know, cars that today are modern. But I, I have a feeling that the second like solid state batteries come around, all of the cars that are using the current state of batteries are going to become absolutely worthless unless I'm, unless somebody can retrofit solid state batteries. I'm until. sure that was there was a similar argument when someone it, when electronic fuel injection came along someone said this is the end of carbureted cars there's no need no to- it's, that's not a that's not a valid it would have to be like a, 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 a completely different form of like engine came along like if you could so the argument there like a, like a apples to apples argument would be like oh all of a sudden you can power your cars with i don't know water right like that, that, that whole like trope where people, oh, you can power your car with water. Then, then all of a sudden, the internal combustion engine car would become obsolete. I just, I have a hard time believing. Think about how many of these Ionic fives are going to make over the next few years, and then you're going to tell me in 20 years, all those cars, you're not going to be able to drive them. Yeah, all. I think we're. I think I electricity think it, at the end of the day is electricity, Dad. There will be an well, aftermarket community I, I, that supports. The I, older I can, cars. I can point, I can point to like the Leaf right now. A Leaf is a first generation Leaf, right, where the battery is uh, now what, uh, maybe 40 miles, right, where you get 40 miles, is pretty much worth less than all the sum of its parts that are in it. Because People always point to the first-gen LEAF, and you are right. The first-gen LEAF was a basket case of battery longevity. It had air-cooled batteries, which was a terrible but situation. I'm just saying that, that, but look at older Teslas. If you look at the data on how well Tesla batteries are holding up, the vast majority of them still have over yeah. 85 or 90% of their usable capacity, yeah, well, look, look, look dating the, back to 2012 look at or the Roadster. 2013. That's almost valuable. But once again, Roadster, garbage pile of reliability. <laughs> These early ones, you're right, Dad. The Roadster was a mess. The first generation Nissan left, Leaf was a mess. But going back to 2013, 2014 on a Model S, those batteries are proving to be very reliable for the vast majority of cases. They just are holding up quite I well. I think we're in a weird time right now with supply and demand. Let, let's look back on what a model, like a 2012 Model S, will be worth this time next year. Uh, and I, I, I promise you, it'll probably be. I think it'll probably be worth than a less than the internal combustion engine version of that car. So, right, right now, because we're in this transition, yeah. and we're switching to the new tech. The new tech carries a premium, but once like the new tech doesn't carry a premium, um, and and uh, like, like I say, I would point to like because cars are becoming like you know like disposable electronics, like like phones and computers, and all computers have little to zero value. In fact, it costs you more to get rid of them than it is to. To hold on to them, and I think the same thing will happen with these electric cars, unless there's a secondary market for like like retrofitting Which new is technology. Happening. If you look at like Leafs, for example, there are now companies that will retrofit the new Leaf battery packs into the first gen Leaf, so you can upgrade from like a 24 kilowatt hour to up to a 60 kilowatt hour pack on a first gen Leaf, which is very cool. But the, once again, it costs more than the car's worth. We 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 consider yeah. that video. We wanted to do a video where we would buy a Leaf. One of these first gen leaves and then retrofitted, except the cost of retrofitting it was like seven or eight thousand dollars. I which, mean, and which, I, which meant that once you retrofitted it, you'd have a four thousand dollar car that's now worth five thousand after you've put eight thousand into it. I have another real world example of a company supporting really old technology that a lot of people thought would brick the car. We had a two thousand, a twenty year old, twenty one year old Honda Insight, which was hugely advanced for its day. It had a, the first car sold in America with a hybrid system with an ancient battery pack 
that who knows where you'd find another one. If you had told me 15 years ago that when the battery failed, you could still get a new one, I'd be like, no way. There'd be absolutely no way. And we were able to find a company that built a retrofitted a battery pack into that car for fifteen hundred dollars. Yeah, you made and my point. And they built seventeen thousand of these you cars. Made, the battery was only fifteen hundred bucks. You made my point though. Unfortunately, I wish you hadn't, but you had. So, look, we paid way too much. So that car was worth on a good day two and a half thousand. We paid four. Sure. So, so let's let's say that it's worth two and a half. We got it. The battery. So we paid two and a half for it. The battery pack. Like you know, took a giant dump, so we had to spend fifteen hundred dollars. So now we spent fifteen hundred dollars on a car that's worth two and a half. So we're into it realistically four. And then when we sold it, we sold it for two and a half. So we, if we had paid market value for that car, right, we would have lost fifteen hundred dollars. We since we didn't pay market value for the car, we ended up losing three thousand dollars. We way over for it. Yes, you're right. It's expensive. But my point is, if there's companies supporting a car where they sold less than 20,000 globally 20 years ago, there are going to be companies supporting I hope, the I hope you're car. right, because, you know, once again, like I said, it depends on, you know, availability of resources, what the economy is doing. You know, if, um, if, um, if, if it's profitable to be able to, you know, extract these things for how much you can do it. If, if there's a finite amount right now, they're talking, it's a horrible idea with electrification, mining the oceans, you know, which would kill all the fish in their eyes. You know, of course, they're not going to say it's going to kill the fish. It's going to be great for us. But, you know, if you start mining oceans, fish are going to die, which is where a majority of people get a lot of their food. It's just, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult time that we live in uh, for electrification, uh, I think. The uh, the when, it, when it starts to actually become, you know, exp and I think, would you agree this year has been the year of electrification? No, I don't. I think we're still way far really? out. I think this year it's become we're like. We're still under 5% of adoption. No, 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 no. I mean, this is where, no, obviously it's not where the, where it tilted, but it's where like the public and the manufacturer consciousness tilted toward electrification, where people all of a sudden realize that it's actually coming uh, and, you know, the moment it's you, know, you never know unless you look back in time when when that critical moment in time was when it went from one trend to another trend right you can't do it when you're living through it only when you're past it but in my gut and my estimation we're living through that moment this year we lived through it where it went from like oh it's all in internal combustion to it's all going to be electrified so the last thing i will say about this matter which i think is very important to remember yep. is it's easy to look back at a brass air car and say it's still on the road 100 years ago, right? God it's, help you if you have to ride it. It's drive easy it, but. to look back at a Volkswagen from 1965 and yeah. say it's still on the road 60 years later. But these are vehicles that were extremely simple to keep on the road. They were extremely primitive in their basic engineering, single barrel carburetor, um, mechanically adjusted valves. Look at the new gasoline vehicles that are coming out with turbocharging, direct injection, extremely high um, compression ratios. We're talking about vehicles with not one, not two, but 10, 15, 20 ECUs to keep these cars running. It's it's yeah. it's not a stretch to say that an electric car with three moving parts in an electric motor. Well, hold on, hold on. You know how many ECUs an electric car has? A like, lot. Like ten times the, that of an internal combustion car. The basic car. mechanics that make the car run but the, are with, very simple. But without the ECU, none of it works. Yeah, but but think about the the, the turbocharging and the 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 aluminum blocks that we're seeing and, uh, and all this. But that stuff is very, fixable. But the ECU. Yeah, but they still need ECUs. Gasoline cars, they have just as many I know, ECUs but you have as electric cars. Ten times cars. as many electric cars. And you've got three moving parts in the drivetrain in a in a electric car. Whereas in a gasoline car, you have twin turbos and supercharging, and you've got direct injection, and you've got injectors, um, and and you've got the potential for valve knock and oils that you yeah, need to be changed, and all this stuff. Well, time will tell. Yeah, I, I do strongly tell. believe. I know everyone makes the argument. Look at a first gen Leaf or a Tesla Roadster, garbage cars by longevity. But look at the new stuff that's coming out. I think in 15, 20 years' time, it'll still be on the road. I think it'll be thrown by the wayside the second technology gets better. Because right now, look, at the end of the day, here's the thing, right? Uh, we are taking kind of a huge step backwards in convenience. You know, we, we had this long discussion about like charging levels, yada, yada, yada. But, you know, Try like you know charging a car unless you do it at home right at night, which is very which convenient. Is the very, vast majority, of people. which is very convenient, but like otherwise, you know, you pull up the gas station and 45 seconds later you're out of there, uh, and uh, that is nowhere near where you're at with electrified cars right now. So at the end of the day, electrified cars in terms of charging are still a huge pain in the butt. So if you can actually get to some place with like solid state batteries where they have like 
let's say the range becomes incredible, like which it can, like a thousand miles where you know charging doesn't become a thing. Or let's say you can get charging to the same amount of time you spend at, at the gas station now. Then, of course, it's going to be a much different argument. Anyway, there's a bunch of cars I drove that I didn't get to talk about because we're out of time. So if you want to see my thoughts on the new uh, Porsche uh, Taycan uh, GTS Cross uh, Sport, sorry, not, not the Cross. You drove that one. The Sport Turismo. Uh, head on over to, you know, tfl-studios.com along with the EQS, along with the new Mercedes-Benz SL. Um, they're all up there and uh, check it out over there. All right. We'll see you guys on another episode. Hey, and thanks for a great discussion, Tommy. I think that was fun. Yep. I think it was interesting. And uh, thank you guys for watching. And uh, keep in mind, uh, um, you know, we're, uh, we're cranking out a lot of uh, car stuff. So we really appreciate the fact that you're here uh, at uh, the podcast. And we really want to thank all of our Patreon supporters who, uh, you know, uh, it's always, it, whenever I get that little email notification that somebody has joined us, I'm really grateful. Uh, and I wish I had the opportunity to thank all of you. I just don't. We, we were inundated with emails. I mean, it's, you know, at this point, it's hundreds um, a week, if not more. Uh, and so I'm kind of losing the ability to, to personally reach out and thank every one of you. But if you're listening to this, thank you. Thank you.